All right, guys, this might just be the showdown of the century. We've got conservative parents versus liberal teachers. We've been seeing this back and forth happen for the past, I don't know, several years now. But it's really ramped up in recent years with conservative parents showing up to school board meetings and confronting liberal teachers. But Jubilee did a middle ground video where they bring in conservative parents and liberal teachers, have them duke it out on the issues, and we're going to react. Let's get into it. All right, this is a special episode of Jubilee Middle Ground. It's not my episode, it's not the one that I filmed, but the special guest in this one is our very own Marissa Streit, who is the CEO here at PragerU. So she got invited to Jubilee Middle Ground <laughs> as a conservative parent. So we're gonna see how it goes, see how she does, and see how all of these other fellow debaters, <laughs> I guess do, debaters for the day. Let's watch the video. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Middle Ground, they bring people from two opposing sides, sometimes three, ask them a question or put out a statement like, I believe there are two genders. If you agree with the statement, you walk forward and sit down. If you disagree, you stay in the back and eventually we all come together to discuss what we think and feel on the issue. So let's watch. Of life. Yes. So would it be okay to include a book with a man having a relationship with a 12 year old in that book? I know See, it's extreme. No. Hold on, but just no, hear me out. Because now hear you're equipped gay people to no, pedophiles. No, no, I'm, this is why I'm bringing it up, is who establishes the boundary? The law. But the law. All right, it's getting intense already. Whoever edits that little beginning part is just so solid. Yeah, that intro you, slaps for makes sure. Makes you feel something. Let me turn the captions off. Teachers have their own political agendas. Pals, teachers have their own political agendas, of course. Literally everybody should be walking forward. And it's not, this is not a partisan thing. It's not something that should be debated. Teachers, whether you are conservative or liberal, have their own political agendas. And this is something that people don't want to admit. They're going to be like, oh, no, I'm a teacher and I'm conservative and I don't show my views in any way, shape or form. You might not directly espouse your views. You do show them like whether you uh, believe it or not, you do show them. Now, you can tiptoe around subjects, not give anybody any look into your personal lives. But teachers have their own political agendas. When you leave your child with somebody. I don't care if it's the greatest person in the world. The greatest person in the world is going to influence your child in the way that they see fit. That's just how it's going to be. Whether they try to or they don't, who they are as a person seeps into these people. And because we're in a particularly politically divisive time, kids are bringing up the subject matters. Teachers are bringing up the subject matters. And yeah, we're all going to have our own affiliations that seep through. I think I would take a softer uh, stance on this one. I mm -hmm. think I agree with you that, of course, there's a sense in which every teacher in the world will have some sort of political or underlying ideology that mm -hmm. can, they can't help but have seep into their job and their role. Yeah. And when you entrust your kids to their care or, the, or time with them, that is going to they're going to be exposed to that one way or another. But yes. I do think some, there is something to be said for the sort of old school type of teachers that I grew up with that were able mm -hmm. to draw the line and treat their job with that air of professionalism that's saying, yes. I am not going to bring my personal politics into the classroom now that, that incidentally, I'm sure that'll still happen mm -hmm. in sort of a residual sense. But once upon a time, the majority or plurality of teachers, I think, had that approach, but I don't think that that is the majority anymore. No, it's not. And it's uh, the the word agenda is really what uh, what frames this for me. Agenda is probably a very strong word. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are probably many teachers that don't have an agenda, but they all have their political leanings, and it does it does show, shine through. Okay. I think it's important to, to recognize that individuals will have political agendas. Yeah. It's a natural thing and people should understand their political views. I think where we need to differentiate it is whether a teacher should have a political agenda in a classroom. But is your idea of a political agenda like these teachers telling students, this is who you should vote for, if you vote for these people it's wrong. Yes, or for ridiculing people, right. the beliefs that they may have for political or religious reasons and uh, using their position of authority to mold the minds of everyone else. When it comes to diversity or these new sort of terms, I am not for 
certain types of uh, so-called diversity uh, when it comes to uh, these new these new kind of topics. And Can stuff. you expand upon that? Like, what do you think? Uh, like critical be race theory or some of the gender ideologies. It's not diverse if you're the teacher, the person of authority in the classroom, and you are saying this is how something should be. Yeah, so, so I come from an elementary perspective. Uh, I'm a first grade teacher, so the conversations we're having in class isn't about the socioeconomic nature of the world. Mm. But, uh, you know, we do talk about just what it looks like for different people in different communities. Uh, so when I talk about a political agenda, uh, the agenda that I have in the classroom is to create an environment where folks are able to he said folks. Mm, red flag. Always a red flag. Red flag. When somebody says folks, ugh, red unless they're Southern. Southern, it's normal. But folks is a very left-leaning term now because they use it to just refer to all people rather than having like some sort of gendered term. Often no, spelled with an X. With an X, <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Stand from wherever someone's coming from. The problem with that, and I understand the 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 sentiment as a teacher. If you if a child is sitting there and they happen to be black, and you're saying, "Well, th black people, such and such and such." I mean, you're really that's yeah, not I, okay. I do have to stop you there because that's not really said. It's not mm -hmm. said black people do this. Well, it's I'm not just, said it's Mexicans do this. Again, it's it's trying to understand from multiple perspectives. That's not saying that every group aligns on the same thought. That's not saying every group is a monolith. What it's saying is, even if you disagree with somebody or you come from a different tradition or a different cultural background, those people's opinions can still be valid. This is interesting. This is just something that I noticed on the side here. It's often on these Jubilee videos and videos similar to this, you'll see people show up with like their political slogans on the shirt. And uh -huh. then there's something it's so there's something so telling about that. And I haven't quite thought about it enough to say exactly what that is. But he's got an Embrace Change t-shirt on. She's got, I think, a, ma a Mass Exodus t-shirt on about like probably leaving the left or something like that. And there's something so interesting about like needing that to be on your body, branded, I feel this way. And I like went through my phasal time of doing that and just being like, you know, I can't breathe and I support BLM and even like the socialism sucks t-shirts or whatever. And I just realized at some point, like, why do I feel the need to like <laughs> brand myself with this idea? It's so wild to me. Yeah, like I, I'm no not shade. entire. Yeah, exactly. It's like I'm not entirely opposed to like you representing the cause that you believe in or whatever. Right. But there is an air of like your your politics doesn't have to be your whole personality yeah. in this. There's so. an air of just needing it. You just need it a little bit. And the disagree step forward. Disagree or stepping forward. I wonder how they're going to say they disagree. It's probably on Taylor's I'll point. I'll be honest. As a teacher, especially after COVID and all of that, I don't have time for a political agenda. <laughs> I'm here trying to catch up with curriculum, mm. pick up my readers that are, you know, two, three grade levels behind. I do not have time for that. I teach social emotional skills and all of that, but I'm not here to kind of, you need to believe this. Okay. So she just said something interesting, social emotional. Social emotional learning is often left-leaning slanted teaching. Well, I'm not accusing her of that. I wanna hear what she means by social emotional skills because often it is coupled with a political agenda. So they'll deny the political agenda and say, well, I just teach diversity, equity, and inclusion, or I just teach social emotional learning. And then you delve into that and you're like, oh, so you do have a political agenda. This, this, and that, no. If you're a good person, we're good, we're gravy. All good. You know what I mean? But what does a good person mean? Exactly. Your definition, and sometimes this can happen and it becomes political, is what is your definition of a good person? Mm -hmm. Would you think that I- Alicia! I gotta give another shout out to Alicia Cross. Uh, she is fantastic and she is a strong, strong mama doing her thing and representing. Uh, and yeah, she's great. I'm a good person because I'm raising my kids to be with Judeo-Christian values and they live in a heterosexual, heteronormative home where we talk about how divorce is wrong, cheating is wrong. We have friends of the LGBT community, but we teach our children that from a biblical perspective, that's not okay. Your definition of whether or not they are good could be very different than my definition of whether or not they are good. To kind of clarify, in my classroom, if they're kind and they're not bashing anybody, judging anybody, kind of throwing out names, anything like that, they're good. Fair it's enough. not to say that topics like that don't come up in class. And I do open it up to discussion. I just keep it clear that we're, this is a safe space. We don't judge each other. We're not going to bash each other. I understand you have your own experiences, but we're not going to come in with an agenda, you can say. And I feel like this idea of parents and their teachers of their political biases and all of this is just all of this fear that 
is clouding their judgment, clouding. Except we have yeah. we have numerous, not just we have experiences. We have, yeah, my own yeah. child. First week of school, what pronouns you wanted to go by? I mean, not what's your favorite subject? How can I help you succeed academically? Who's to say that wasn't a part of the questions too? You know. And understand but that so, question could but, stand out. But, but so like, maybe why, you don't but, understand but, that you're why? teaching because, politics. Because, but that's not politics. Because, that's just no. like basic respect. <laughs> yeah. See, she didn't walk Here forward. She didn't walk forward when they said, "Do teachers have a political agenda?" And she said, "I disagree with that." She just said that asking your pronouns is not a political agenda. Whether or not you think it should be a political point does not mean that it is that it isn't one. It clearly is one. It is a source of a great political divide right now. So just because you think it shouldn't be, does not mean that it is not, <laughs> if that makes sense. That's, I think that's beautiful. That's what you that's, but it's not true. That's, that's beautiful. Right. Not think, to me. So I think you need to, your idea that that's basic respect. Uh -huh. What is the framework of that? Because I think that many teachers are going through these trainings mm -hmm. and the trainings are saying, this is the framework of how we operate in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But where did that idea come from? Is because it's based off, it's called, As, a thing, it's called a thing called data. Did you so do a that lot of, No, no, hold on. A lot of schools have research really? and development. And so the state also does. So in the state of California, we do research. He is giving me PTSD of the guy from Dr. Phil. So if somebody wears their hair like you're wearing it, you put that on the same level as, as racism. Absolutely. Wow. I put that on the same wow. level as white supremacy because white supremacy is intersectional. The way he comes in, he talks, like he has like the sort of same sort of timbre to his voice talks. It's a thing called data. Very, very condescending. Yeah. Uh, and oof, yeah, just oof. So the, at the end of the day, my job is not just to make your kid to feel comfortable. I got 55 students. I got to make I 55 students feel I agree comfortable. With that. And so when your kid comes home and tells you, well, mom, the teacher said, what's my pronouns? Yeah, I did say, what's your pronoun? I also said, what's your favorite TV show? What's your favorite food? I am a college professor now. I was previously a third, fourth grade teacher. Teaching third and fourth grade was horrible. Dealing with parents who thought their child was special and should be treated a certain way. It just wasn't doable. The constant complaining, the accusing people of doing things that are not going on in our classes, not being enough for their child, uh, it was just too much. When parents don't have the knowledge of what goes on inside of a school, I think it's important for those parents to go to the school. And we as educators like our parents to be involved. You know, again, I, I have too many students to push an agenda. I just, I do my job, what they pay me to do. See, everybody just use these blankets. I have too much, uh, too much time to put out an agenda, but also what are you guys' pronouns? I don't have enough time to like get into anything other than my curriculum. Also, Black Lives Matter. It's like, okay, <laughs> I don't have any time to have a political agenda, but I have to make all of the students feel comfortable in some way, which is a complete negation of what you just said before. You just said at the exclusion of your child, I have to make these other children feel comfortable, but I have to make all the children feel comfortable and I get it it's it's a tough task you know if you have 25 left-leaning kids in a school and 25 right-leaning kids in a school you are bound to step on toes it's going to happen regardless of what you do because it has infiltrated all of the political discussions that we're having but you could do this we're not going to talk about any of that and I'm not going to give you my opinion on any of that and guess what you know who would be uncomfortable in that situation? Both sides equally uncomfortable. <laughs> and that's how you know you're doing good because it means everybody is being actually treated equally, not with equity, but with equality. Saying, I'm not gonna delve into any of that. I'm, I'm not gonna ask you your pronouns, but I'm also not gonna negate the fact that you can do whatever you wanna do in your own personal life. This is school. This is not a political stage. This is not a debate. This is school. Now let's get back to math. That's all you gotta do. Discussion about sexuality doesn't belong in schools. Uh, okay. This is a multifaceted question. Discussions about sexuality. It depends on what you mean by sexuality. Are we talking about orientation? Are we talking about practicing safe sex? Are we talking about an abstinence class? Like, what are we talking about? And that needs, you need to define those terms. Now, I lean towards agreeing and saying, no, sexuality is not the conversation to be had by schools, but I wanna think about it from a logical perspective as to how we got to having that conversation. And probably how we got to having that conversation was rates of teen pregnancy and children who were not having those conversations at home 
uh, bearing the brunt of, of that irresponsibility on behalf of their parents or their caregivers. So the school and the government decides maybe this is a short little conversation we need to have in schools just so kids who are not getting that conversation know what they need to do. The issue is you got a bunch of different parents with a bunch of different value sets sending their kids to school and getting a one stamp factory setting version of whatever they're teaching regarding sex. So you have to weigh that out. Does not having a conversation about safe sex in school lead to more teen pregnancy, lead to things that are not necessarily beneficial for society? If yes, then maybe we need to come together and, and figure out what that conversation needs to look like. If no, if there's really no benefit being garnered from having these conversations about sexuality in school, then get rid of them. But we have to decide that. We have to actually look, see what's happening. I had a sex ed class when I was in third grade, and it was quite simple. Boys go in this room, girls go in this room, they play a little video on a black and white TV. You know, you see the, the genitalia, and you're like, oh God, I got one of those, cool. Now we're figuring out what I am. The fear is these schools have no boundaries. If they do the classroom thing where they want to split kids up, what, how many genders are we going to do this? Are we going to put boys, um, them, and then girls, and then how many rooms do we need to create for equality? Are we really chasing equity? And I think parents now are beginning to realize we've got to stop this and create framework about sexuality, especially in a hyper-sexualized culture. My mm. kids don't need to know at six, seven, and eight years old about different types of sexual acts. Mm. That's not appropriate. not appropriate. People think that this is just kind of happening. It's a one-off. It is in so many schools uh, where I live in Florida, there was a poster going around where kids could text anonymous strangers to get information about sex. And on this poster in school, wanna get laid? Wow. I mean, this is, it's beyond, and, and there is a push for pleasure-based sex. Pleasure for who? My oldest is nine years old. Mm. She's in third grade and she's been exposed to things and we do have conversations about it. But that's a conversation that I should be having with my nine-year-old daughter. If a sixth grader or a fourth grader is going to be prompted by a teacher, hey, what are your pronouns? As a parent, I should have a heads up about that because they're not even going to understand the question. And so I think that the idea that those conversations are started in the classroom instead of in the home is a big problem. Okay, I get what she's saying. To that point, they're not concerned about you. They're not concerned about the parents who are going to have the conversation in the home. They're concerned about the parents who aren't going to have the conversation in the home. So it's a fair point to say, I already want to talk to that about my kids, but what about the kids who aren't getting that conversation is, I think, something to retort back. When I was in school, my parents were notified weeks prior to any sort of sexual education, and we got sent home with a little paper that said, here, uh, Mrs. So-and-so, we are going to teach your child about sexual education on uh, March 11th, okay? At this time, boys are going to be split into this room. Girls are going to be split into this room. Here are the, some of the points that we're going to be going over. And at the bottom, it had a little check mark. And it said, check this box if you would like to opt out your child on this day from receiving this education, and we will put them in a separate building uh, with the other kids who have opted out of this. I think that's a fair solution. If you want to continue to have that conversation with children through the lens of actual safe sexual education, not gender, not sexuality, uh, allow parents the opportunity to opt out. And responsible parents like the parents here who are saying, I want to have this conversation with my kids or parents who are responsible and say, you know what, I'll allow the school to do this. This looks good. Can send in that paper. I think that's the solution. And I don't know why that's not happening, because that happened when I was a kid. You're you're being well reasoned and reasonable, and uh, I I'm very curious to hear after hearing what you just said because that's the argument that I think these teachers should be making. Yeah, I I doubt that that's what we're about to hear though, so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I have a family member who first day of sixth grade was asked for her pronouns and she stood up and said that as a person of faith she believed that God didn't make a mistake making her a girl and so therefore she identified as a she her and she was sent to the principal's office and punished for that decision. Thankfully we haven't really seen that is. broadly yet but I think it's really damaging to take a shy innocent 11 year old child and make them stand in front of a classroom and determine something that they maybe haven't even put that much thought into. Uh, I like what you said, Sean, about how you were uh, emphasizing you know, how a lot of parents today felt a goodness of the way that sexual education was conducted in the past. 
Uh, so there is an agreement that sexuality should be talked about in schools. Uh, the disagreement is whether it should just be purely heteronormative or if we should include all aspects of sexuality. Um, I don't think that we're doing demonstrations to encourage children how to have sex, uh, but this is something that we are trying to, again, educate and make them aware that this kind of things happen. And while you grow up, you're going to have to experience somebody who's of this orientation. Kids so. are naturally curious. And I think that what I'm hearing from you is I understand where you're, you're maybe potentially coming from. But then where's the line between that sex education and introducing them to porn? Because porn can be educational. I was mm -hmm. a virgin when I got married. And I, for years, I was made fun of and heard, well, how are you going to know if you don't try it? We hear that a lot, too. If you haven't tried to kiss a girl to see if you like it or not, then how do you really know that you're not a lesbian? How do you really know that you're not gay if you've never slept with a guy? How do you really know that you want to be in a monogamous relationship if you don't sleep around? And when you start to introduce those questions to children, specific, specifically prepubescent ones, they're going to naturally be curious, and their emotional and hormonal maturity is not there to be making those types of decisions that have lifelong impact. It's well, you're right, and a lot of them are learning at home, because just like you guys are saying, they come home to tell you things. Well, guess what? Those same kids come to school to talk about what you're telling them at home. You'll be surprised what I hear from students when I do a, what do you think? Well, let me tell you what my mama and daddy did. And look, I don't, I don't, I don't have time. Your kid is not that important to me, not to be rude. I got like 300 students. Your kid is no more important than the other 299. So I don't have time to sit up here and uh, let me get you to think like me. I, I can't get my own 23-year-old to think like me at the end of the day. What needs to happen, and this is just my own personal take, parents need to start being parents because a lot of times the teachers are the parents. They're parenting your kids because absentee parenting. I think that this conversation is... I didn't hear a point in there about the topic that was being discussed. All I heard was, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time. Okay, so then just say that you don't teach sexuality in schools. So is that what you're teaching or is it not? Just make that point and then move on. And the fact that kids come to school with what their parents say, of course. Kids come to school and say everything they've heard for the past 24 hours. Uh, Five-year-olds walk into class and they're like, I saw a frog today. When I walked into school, they say everything that they've ever seen, uh, recognized, experienced, and they throw that at your feet. Now, what you respond to is your choice. <laughs> what you elaborate on is your choice. I'm not understanding. Like, is he just saying I don't have time? Because he's made that point over and over and over and over. I'm not hearing an argument, like, on the basis of what is being discussed. Really interesting, and I think we need to step back and look at why we automatically assume that if we're telling our children about lesbians, gay people, queer people, why do we immediately equivocate that to telling them about what sex is? That can just be something as simple as, here is a book. In this book, there are two dads. This book character has two dads. And kids, they can be inquisitive and that's good, right? But also like, they're gonna be like, cool. There's two dads. All these kids know that there's a dad right. and a dad and a right. mom and a mom, and the yeah. culture is teaching all of that. So what we've noticed is that the curriculum in eighth grade and up is a lot deeper than that. It's more like, here is how you can have sex so you do not get pregnant. Yeah. Illustration of anal sex. That is the stuff yeah. that we are now reacting against. And, and that, sadly, is the, the trust that's being broken. Yeah, I don't feel I, personally any type of way about like having a book that says these are two dads and these are two moms. I feel like the people who might feel some type of way about that are going to be Christian leaning people. So, again, if you're going to have a conversation like that and you know you might be alienating a set of students, let parents know you're going to have the conversation. And curriculum transparency is going to be the new wave, the new future for education so long as we remain on the track that we're on. And it's going to become teachers every quarter or every year having to print out exactly what they're going to be talking about exactly what day give parents the source material which a lot of schools are not doing now a few states have gone forward and passed curriculum transparency but more are going to be coming and they're going to have to hand this into parents and the parents who care are going to have to look through it look through the source material and come back and say i don't want my kid being here for this and this and this and this and this is what it's going to become and eventually public school is just going to like devolve into something totally different. And I think school choice is going to be a massive movement as well, because people are not no longer OK with just sending their kids to a government facility and waiting to see what pops out and, and what comes out. They want somebody they want a business to patronize, basically, and that is going to actually support them in their values.
between teachers and parents. Yeah, and I think we're moving into a conversation about comprehensive sex ed. What I am talking about is when I go into this classroom and I'm teaching kids, I'm not going to just keep teach kids material that is heteronormative. Out of curiosity, it sounds like what you're saying is you want to be able to introduce all ways of life. Like these, yeah. these are the people that are that you will encounter with with throughout life. That is what I'm arguing. Yes. So would it be okay to include a book with a man having a relationship with a 12 year old in that book? I know. I was comment not not on what he just said, but his demeanor is very nice. He mm -hmm. just comes in, it's just like, it sounds like what you're saying is. <laughs> See, <laughs> that's extreme. No, Hold on, but just no, hear me out. Because now hear you're equipped getting gay people to no, pedophiles. No, no, I'm and not. No, that's I, not who that is. No, 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 you're, you're drawing no, a line that I'm not that I'm not drawing. And, the and you're definitely I, crossing the line. I agree. Never I agree. Crossed. It is. A, I, we don't have a political agenda, though. <laughs> we have, teachers do not have political agenda. And how can you not see the point that he's making? Yeah, and he's not he's not making them equivalent. He's just saying. Would you just answer the question? Just say no. Just say no. Because the justification you're using to expose children to a uh, non-heteronormative thing is that they need to be exposed to all walks of life. So mm -hmm. by your own logic, right. this is another walk of life. Would you apply that same logic here? And if so, right. and if not, why not? And you can say no. That's illegal. Yeah. Just There's, say there, no. There, there are good arguments to make, but right. they're, they're not making it. Right. <laughs> I agree. And this is why I'm bringing it up, is who establishes the boundary? The law. But See, there but you go. Period. The, law, the law is the law. But the law that's been signed no, in is no, some No, 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 I'm sorry. No, there's laws against between adults having sex with children. Now, if a student had two parents who happened to be of the same sex, I'm not going to sit there and discount who they are in my class. I cannot do that. I mm. sign a contract. I would never ask anybody to uplift or suppress any child. I want there to be equality in the classroom. So what I am saying is that there are factual instances where this is being taught in classrooms. I pulled my children out of public school because there are so many instances of this happening. I am a parent. I'm looking in the book bag every day. I'm checking in with homework. I am talking to the teachers and the, the, the principals and I'm involved. But we didn't know that, you know, during class there were images shown of literal sex acts or describing certain situations that were inappropriate for young children. We have mm -hmm. a belief system at home and the children want to break the boundaries of that belief system naturally because we're human beings. That's just what we do. And we're trying to confine them to a set of beliefs to say this is what is right in our home. And we're seeing the schools get funding from a Planned Parenthood. And they tried to pass a bill to put uh, medical facilities to offer abortions in high schools here in California. I've read that and bill. It all, it's gradual, right? It starts with this is a book that has two dads. This is a book with two moms. This is, and it's just a gradual curiosity that could leverage and break away that child from the, the root in the home. My education growing up was fully public education. College is where I started getting a curiosity for, for truth and education. And I think I'm so passionate about the education system today because it is obviously broken, but how do we fix it? Mm -hmm. Many of these progressive ideas in fixing it is just more empathy, empathy, sympathy, safety. But in reality, I see the public school system isn't actually actually accomplishing the goal of what education is, which is teaching critical thinking, how to understand, how to ask good questions, and then comprehend how to problem solve. Wait, can I just say something about this last po um, point that kept coming up of like having the, he's talking about how having the book mm -hmm. um, leads to this, that, and the other. And I just, on the topic of we're just trying to expose them to different lifestyles and stuff, mm -hmm. I think speaking as a Christian, I guess, um, and as a conservative, is there it becomes social engineering it becomes an agenda when it's it goes beyond an effort to represent reality accurately mm -hmm. and according to gallup polls um i think the the most recent numbers i'm seeing here five percent of the u.s population is uh identifies as lgbtq right so if we're talking about five out of every hundred books mm -hmm. that 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 represents reality that's congruent with it mm -hmm. once you go beyond that and, then, and then, i mean it's not like a hard and fast number sure sure, sure. Rule, but the spirit yeah, of what you're I'm saying, saying yeah it, you're yeah. saying it's over and over and over and over right yeah and i think that there's no regulating principle for these people i'm saying reality should be the regulating principle mm -hmm. for these teachers there seems to be this it, there's no all gas no brakes when it comes to promoting this ideology and it's not it's like it's it's the same energy that we see in Hollywood with the effort to do you know let's have representation. It's like yeah, okay, it's well, like what are over. we representing? Yeah, yeah. Are we representing reality or are we representing 
your utopian vision or is it this weird energy of like overcoming this perceived boogeyman of white supremacy so that we have to fight back against it by overcasting everything now and then then we get into the equity versus equality conversation and i think progress will be had when because i I see the point, and I guess I'm saying all this because I do see the point of the liberal teachers of like, you know, we we shouldn't be like sheltering kids or imposing this, you know, bubble Christian, you know, worldview on them either. But all, and then also right. uh, to Sean's point earlier, um, if you're if you're seeking to represent all lifestyles, are you also going to? teach them about a Christian lifestyle if, right. if, or is that to the exclusion? Uh, uh, why does that have, have an exception? Fair it's, question, yeah. And it's the same. And one, one more thought is, is in the same way that we say, like, we don't care if you teach about the existence of critical race theory in the classroom, but don't teach it as fact and as reality. Yep. Don't teach the tenets of it. Don't to the don't teach the kids to see the world through that lens. And so I don't have a problem with kids learning about the existence yep. of gay couples, but don't teach them the radical tenets of gender ideology or impose this new worldview that isn't congruent with reality. Exactly. Just you can say there's ideas. There's a bunch of different ideas and kids are going to come with you with come to you with their own ideas and you can get into that and just like leave it out there for people to to agree or disagree with. But when you impose this is the problem. And we're going to skip this affirmative action one. We speak at length about affirmative action over and over. We're going to go to the next prompt. Okay. Teachers with guts make schools safer. Ooh, who's going to walk forward? Teachers with guns make schools safer. I'm not walking forward on this. I think that's a really big, big generalization to make. Are you walking forward on this? I don't uh, think so. The rates of school shootings are nowhere near making it necessary for teachers like you know look at like the rates at which school shootings happen and then imagine you pass legislation that's like teachers can now carry guns you know how many guns are going to be on school campuses all of a sudden because you introduce like legislation to combat this yeah i don't think mm -mm. not for me the the, uh the libertarian old southern boy in me is wants to be like you know what whatever uh but the reality of the situation is it, there's there's there, there's definitely a hesitancy there. It is yeah. interesting to me too, though, that like you know we, according to if you if you get your tears from libs of TikTok, there's like ninety percent of the teachers out there would never go anywhere near a gun, anyways. Right. So there's that. Um, but it shouldn't be necessary. I, in the wake yeah. of of one of the recent school shootings, we talked about the idea of like ramping up security, and we looked at how much money we're sending toward all these different projects and and money and. We, it would take only, you know, a, f- a fraction of what we're sending overseas to beef up security and put armed guards at every school in America yeah. if we're really that desperate to solve this problem. So I, I think there are much, many other measures that you can take to ramp up school security so before arming teachers. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like the most radical legislation you could possibly pass in response to something that could be fixed with logistics for the most part. Like uh, this one... I forget who it was. I won't even name a name, but just like looking at schools and looking at how many entry points some school has. Some schools have the elementary school that I went to as a child probably had like 30 to 40 different places that you could access different sections of the school instead of just having one singular access point for people. That's an easy logistics fix for people with like fencing and things that like cause way less damage, way less emotional stress and anxiety. Uh, window proofing and making those uh more more uh locked up and efficient so that people can't just like shoot through windows and all these different things uh yeah there's a lot of just logical things sros student resource officers my high school had student resource officers they broke up fights they handled disputes between kids uh if there was some sort of school shooting you would hope that they would be reliable although you you never know in any situation who's going to be reliable and for what but I hope they get into like some questions here about like, how would you train said teachers who are going to be carrying these guns? Do they have to go to the same trainings that your SROs go to for your school? Does any teacher get to just be having one? Is there a gun safe at the school? Who has access to that safe? How close is it to the children? Because I think the best thing you could do for a school shooter is be like, yeah, that teacher carries a gun right there. So... Why don't you just go to that teacher instead of having to steal one from mommy and daddy or try to find one at the store? Yeah, I just think it's nightmare. It presents nightmare. a lot more problems than yes. the original problem. Yes. It can. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know what? 
I'm going to yeah, disagree. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so I was really in between. I didn't really know how I felt about this issue at first. Um, but then I started looking at uh, places that had armed their teachers. So I believe that model is good. It has to be voluntary. Yes. So the teachers have to want to do it themselves. They have to be well trained. Yes. They have to have uh, background checks periodically. That has been successful. If, if we're trusting teachers. What does what is your marker of that being successful is my question. Like has a school shooting been stopped because they had an armed teacher on the campus or did just nothing happen and you have an armed teacher on the campus? Because I don't think especially in the time that we're in now and how quickly this legislation must have been passed in the state that she's referring to, how would you have a marker for how successful it's been? It's just like, oh, we've had n no incident in 30 days or something like that. Right. You know what I mean? It's either an unfalsifiable claim on one end or it's an anecdotal bit of evidence on the other end. And right. so it's hard to like draw a broad conclusion. You can't draw yeah. a broad conclusion yeah. based on that. Yeah which in some cases we do, in some cases we don't. But if my mindset is that if we're going to trust teachers to mold our children's minds and educate them, they're there for eight hours a day. We should also trust and kind of enable them to protect themselves and our kids physically. I think by no means should we ever force a teacher to carry a gun. But if a, a teacher is willing to take on the responsibility of learning how to handle a weapon properly. <laughs> See, here's the issue. There's a whole lot of people willing to take on responsibilities they shouldn't have. That they shouldn't, responsibilities that they should not take on whatsoever. And you just have to worry. I, there's a lot of stuff. Like, I know we, I think we do have this idealistic view of teachers wanting to be like so good to children and they're really there for the kids. And I think a lot of teachers are there simply for the children and to help them. And you would think that the teachers who want to carry guns are those type of teachers, but they could also be some pretty horrible people <laughs> that want to carry a gun on campus. And the fact that we are even having conversations about how shitty schools are means that we absolutely should not have teachers carrying guns. Absolutely not. And I think a lot of people just assume that the teachers who would want to carry guns would be pro their values simply because they want to have a gun. Yeah, no, there's so much abuse that happens. There's so many bad things that happened on school campuses that I would never want to introduce a firearm into that situation. Yeah, like as a matter of principle, just to to give good faith here. Yeah. Like if Jocko Willink is my kid's elementary school teacher and he happens to want to have a weapon in, <laughs> On school campus, if the best to, possible person I'm, is my school, that's what I'm. This is yeah. I'm saying as a matter of principle. Yeah. So it's a steel manning the argument. Um, then I'm just saying like it's not facially like impossible for this for there to be a teacher who I would personally, as a parent, like be comfortable with them being armed yeah. as a measure of self of defense within the classroom. But trying to implement a policy in which all teachers can be armed, yeah, presents so many potential issues with how are they being trained is the, are we certain that like what's the process for locking them up yeah. uh, making sure that the the weapons stay out of the hands of students all those other issues not every teacher is Jocko Willink and that's the point I'm making is that yeah. you know there is maybe a, a case in which yes I would I would support us if I'm in a schoolhouse in rural Tennessee and <laughs> Jocko is the teacher and he I want him to hold it down sure like Ron Swanson type vibes yeah but in yeah. a uh as a matter of, of policy for an entire state or school system or right. country, it yeah. seems to present there there are better ways to solve this issue or mitigate against it than this, which would seem to create more. Yeah, just sounds like a more and more and more 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 more, more problems. <laughs> I think that we should allow them to do that for us, and it frankly would be an incredible service to us. An incredible service to you. All right, so just to break it open, this conversation is so much more nuanced than to arm or not to arm. And if you want to save a school, you need to get parental engagement. Let's look at the mindset of the individuals that are going into these homes with firearms. Those individuals are not mentally okay. There's something wrong at happening, whether it's at school, in the house, whether it's, who knows, maybe it's the, something they're consuming online. And I think that's the parent's job to continue to engage to make sure that child is healthy. A lot of these kids as well that are going into schools that are not mentally um, healthy, they, they're coming from single parent households. They're coming, they're living with their grandparents. There's something, there's something intrinsically with their identity that's broken. And I think that whether you arm a school or you don't, it's not gonna change it if you don't address the real issue. I, I agree with you that people that are, you know, perpetrating these crimes and these like 
mass casualties are messed up individuals, I would absolutely agree. Uh, mass shootings are a uniquely American problem. So if we try to understand what's the root, why is America solely have that problem, I would say it's a gun culture problem. So if the idea is, you know, should we try to remove aspects of gun culture that really purvey in our society, um, should we do that or should we just increase the amount of firearms we can have in every single space just so that way we're properly ready for I a gunfight whenever I want to clear yeah I guess it's like I guess he's saying like a mass shootings are a uniquely American problem I think like obviously violent crime is not a uniquely American problem I think when I read up on this like there are other countries that just have higher limits of violent crime per capita than the United States but we have guns so of course yeah if you want to commit a violent crime, you have the choice between a knife and a gun. I think you're going to choose the gun. I think there's no denying, there's no denying that that is uh, an issue. As far as whether or not gun control solves that problem, that's a whole nother question, and it doesn't. If you're not talking about like gang violence and that sort of span of things, I don't know. I, 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 there's a certainly nuance to the conversation that. Uh, there are just certain people that should not be able to get guns, and we definitely need to solve whatever crack in the system is happening that people who should not have them and are mentally incapable of, of being armed are arming themselves. Fight gun culture. Are you saying that there's like the shoot 'em up, bang 'em up video games? Are you saying no? I wouldn't say it's video games. I'd say institutions like the NRA that heavily impose. You know, you need to own not just firearms, but as many firearms as you can. You'd have to find. I. How is that? Yeah, I, we'd have to look into that. So he's saying like the NRA because their their gun lobbyists and everything are contributing to the issue of of school shootings. How do you substantiate that? Like, are people who are committing these mass shootings also following NRA content? Is there like a, a link between those two things? Are they being uh, incentivized or educated through products and in, in marketing that the NRA is doing? Or are they people who have a mental illness who want to kill and hurt as many people as possible and guns, logically for anybody who's trying to commit a crime like that, gun is your first option. I don't know that you can just go and pin it on the NRA because you see them as this like big lobbyist boogeyman for, for guns. Uh, because I would, I would argue probably that most of the people who support uh, the NRA or members of the NRA are law-abiding citizens who just support the Second Amendment and want to own firearms, and it might be through some deep love of America and American history or for protection or for hunting or whatever. I'm not sure there's a link between, like, the NRA and mass shootings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a big jump. It's it's a stretch in the, in the way that he's characterizing it. I would, I would say but you could say that the NRA contributes to the proliferation of the availability of weapons in sure. the U.S., and that increased availability gives mass shooters the opportunity to yep. acquire one. But that that's still there's an intermediate step there that he's yeah. not accounting for. And uh, it's it's not the strongest argument. Yeah. And he specifically says culture. Like, I want what do you mean by the culture of it? Um, right. Because, like, as you're saying, gun culture is actually very safe. There's a reverence for it. It's not like hunting. Yeah. Depending on what gun culture you like. There's so right. many like sex of this <laughs> argument. Like, We're what talking are about you gang talking? culture is not safe. Yeah. Yeah, but... yeah. What do you mean when you say gun culture? Right. Yeah, I, that that evokes to me like people who go to gun shows and want to you know post the pictures online about their, their right. I mean like the I don't know patriotic ones or right not the like weird ones gun enthusiasts yeah not yeah. the like weirdos who are you know it's like dark room and scary pictures and stuff like that I'm not talking about that but like right. anyways that in, in that sense gun culture I think is not where the the, the violence lies. is coming from yeah yeah so it's again it's like a false equivocation right right false equivalency it, this would take <laughs> so long to like delve into and talk about yeah. where this is all coming from but anyways. I personally would not like to be armed. Uh, I do not want to take lethal action in the classroom, and I, I want to make it a safe and inclusive environment. By the or way, any if a teacher, te any teacher has that stance, then yes, you should not be armed yeah, if you're if you're not ready or prepared to take lethal action, which is another issue. Like some classrooms will have them, some not. It's just have trying to have armed teachers as solution just is yeah. Here's the issue: issues. I don't want the teacher who doesn't want to be armed being armed. Exactly. I also don't want the teacher who wants to be armed being armed. <laughs> I really don't want either of you. I don't want this overconfident. Yeah, I'll be the one to protect kids, and everything goes down to to be the one to do it either. And I don't want this guy who doesn't want to do it to be it either. Mm. And it just sort of points to me that this is not a logical conclusion on the issue. And maybe we don't put very dangerous <laughs> weapons in the hands of people who were hired to educate children. This is a response measure to particular violence that goes on in our schools here in America. And personally, I think we should focus more towards solutions to prevent these occurrences from happening rather than just implementing Agreed. responses implying that these actions Both. will occur. Sure, but then, yeah, the, what's, what do you do in the meantime? The thing is, teachers are hired to educate. They're not hired to assess risk. 
They are not hired to figure out a dangerous situation. These are things that police officers and detectives spend their entire careers figuring out. And still, with the rates of police brutality, and we can say they're not high or whatever, but not even just police brutality. Just Let's talk about just police not understanding the law and doing their job wrong. It does happen a lot of the time because you have so many things swirling around your brain at the same time. Now, make that police officer a teacher that doesn't have the same training at all, make them armed and tell them that they have to assess the risk of their students and be the one to take action when something goes down. You are asking for a nightmare, a nightmare. I, and I'm just going to be honest with you, you don't want me to have a gun because I, I had to go back to therapy in the last few months. And so I agree with a lot of what you guys are saying, what your plan was. But I would also say mental health. We got to understand some of these school shootings are done because people have snapped. People have natural biases and things like that. And people could act on those biases. Then they could be guns drawn and not a clear mind, you know. Like as a parent, how would you feel knowing that you don't know which teachers have a gun? and you've had bad experiences with prior teachers. What if that teacher oh. that absolutely, you know, so blown my answer, up kind my of thing. answer, my answer to your question is I feel the same way about the guard in front of my kid's school. I don't really know the guard, but he's gone through training and I presume that he knows what he's doing and frankly I feel the same way about a police officer. I don't need the police officer, but they've gone through training and they were willing to take on that responsibility. And so I would apply the same logic. It's so interesting that my question is, what does the training look like? Do they have to go to the police academy to now be a teacher that is armed? You would want equivalent, if not more, training for a teacher who's going to be in this situation. When is it? Is it only possible for them to draw arms when a school sh shooting is happening? Could you do it if a student pulls a knife? Could you do it if students are fighting and you feel like one's life is in danger? When is it? Uh, when is it logical for you to pull that firearm? That's training that police officers go through. Do teachers have to go through that exact same training? And like, for how long? When is it? When is it? Do you know that it's okay? I don't know. There's a lot going on there. That you bring that up because it really ties back to why I feel like we need to be careful about how much responsibility we're saddling teachers with teaching our kids values, right? On the one hand, the system is saying, trust our teachers, they know better than you parents. We should be able to teach them what they need to know about sexuality. On the other hand, you guys are admitting that many teachers are not really uh, checked for mental issues. We don't really know what is happening in these classrooms. I'm not we saying don't that know teachers about what are not friction. checked. We very frequently have like professional development days where we got self-care. So I wouldn't say many by any means. And when I'm coming into the workplace, I'm not bringing in all my baggage as to say, you know, you go into your work, you're not like, oh, I'm so depressed, my kids this, this, So that. why, if there is a teacher who is willing to step forward and will go through the training and will go through the screening, why not empower them to save, to save our kids? I mean, in Uvalde, if there was a teacher who could actually save those children, then maybe we would not have seen so much death. When we place teachers with a firearm. I don't know, you had police officers show up and like how many police officers were in that campus and did nothing? and just sat there for like how long? Like 30 minutes waiting for things to happen. You're gonna, there's gonna be so much, the same thing with Parkland. Police officers were there. Student resource officers were there. Nothing was which, done. Yeah, which, you know, can either speak to a problem with their training or a problem with their individual responses as right. the, the people involved, which would also apply to a teacher. So it goes both ways. I'm just like, it seems like just, uh, it's such a radical response to an issue that is horrifying, right? When you hear about a school shooting, it is horrifying, but you also need to place it in perspective as far as the rates of gun violence, how often school shootings are actually happening. It's a very radical response to something that, quite frankly, does not happen very often. So, like, I'm like, what horrible things happen at school more? Obviously, you have kids dying, so this is, like, the ultimate, like, the ultimate, you're, the 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 loss of life is is just uncomparable to anything. But, like, sexual assault happens on campuses a lot more than, like, school shootings happen and teachers getting involved with students. Like, yeah, let's, let's allow that teacher to go through gun training and manipulate students more. Like, there's so, there's so many things that I could think of in my brain of just ways that this goes horribly wrong arm in the classroom, it takes the instance of a violent occurrence from a possibility in the minds of these children to an inevitability. But in the, the children don't children. know. It is a concealed and carry weapon that has gone through the process of the local sheriff's department, background check, training, yeah, checkups, everything. No one knows everything. what the teacher no one knows. and the, the I, um, police department. I have a logistical question. Yeah. Does this teacher have the gun on them? Yes. You wouldn't it know. is holstered all, on them? All yeah. At all times. It's a concealed okay. carry. It so should just, never just be in a place of a child. Carry, it's illegal no, to I know what a concealed carry is. I just want to clarify 
my thing and why, I, why this question sort of enrages me, why are we asking teachers to carry guns? When did this become an occupational hazard? When did we walk into school and people were like, by the way, you could be shot today, so maybe you wanna have your Glock strapped on you because who knows, this might be your last day on earth. That is ridiculous. If you 50 years ago were to look at a teacher and be like, hey, do you wanna hold this gun with you? You know, like you might need it. They're gonna scratch their heads and look at you funny. This is opening up a bigger conversation, right? But I think that even though it is voluntary, right? We still need to have this conversation. Like it still needs to happen of why, even if a teacher was willing to carry a gun to school, they are even having to be asked to do that in the first place. It's fair. It's fair. Yeah. Right. It yeah. kind of is off topic because off it topic. shifts the conversation back to preventing them from happening in the first place. Right. But well, we're here. Yeah. yeah. You're debating we're, a measure. We're in this space. Yeah. So, uh, but also, I, I understand her sentiments. Yeah. And also to the point of students like not knowing. Isn't that like for me, that's a little bit more anxiety inducing of like, I don't know which teacher has a gun in which classroom I'm in where there is a gun readily available at any moment. Uh, there's double sides. There's two sides to that. Like knowing and not knowing are two different forms of uh, anxiety inducing states. Yeah. Okay. Teachers are not paid enough. I'll walk forward. Of course. I agree. Yeah. Yes. Every day I wake up and I hand to you guys the most precious thing in my entire life, my children. I think that it's important that our society will reflect how much we value you guys. I think that you should receive bonuses if you do a great job. If you're able to represent all of us as Americans, both conservatives and liberals, and you're able to speak on our behalf and take care of our children, we should reward you for that and you should feel rewarded for that. And so I don't know exactly what you make, but I think it is really important that we, we invest in you and we pour into you. And mm -hmm. when I see the entire budget that the state of California, for example, spends on education, and I realize that a sliver fraction of it only goes to you guys, it breaks my heart and frankly makes me so angry. I don't need more bureaucrats. I need more good teachers. I, I left the K through 12 and went to the community college and I do I do pretty well. I'm not, I'm, so I'm gonna be clear with that, but also I have a so master's. So you're not oppressed, thank so God. So I'm, I'm I'm, I have a master's, but I had to work really hard to get where I'm at. Of course. But, um, I, but I'm also in a doctoral program and you're right, I'm paying out of pocket too. Again, I had a student that day saying I can't pay my electric bill how much is your electric bill I'll pay your electric bill and so I put up students in hotels because they have nowhere to live I have a student who doesn't have a family I you know he, he told me the other day I want I need a dad I said I'll be your father because it just broke my heart that a 19 year old is in this world alone doesn't have family <laughs> Yeah, I would be scared to like calculate how much I spent in my for my classroom, right? Yes. Like all the materials, all the things that I'm purchasing, all the things that I'm doing. And it's just interesting to think that we are always told like teachers are heroes. They're teaching the youth of America, but also we're not going to give you enough money to survive comfortably. Like you're going to struggle every day. There have been days when I go to work and I'm like, am I going to have money to put gas in my car? I guess we're going to find out, right? And I know so many other teachers who are struggling to keep afloat. I can't even imagine having a, I can't even think about having a family as a teacher. I think Fair that enough. growing up, I was not the strongest student. I didn't necessarily see the point in what we were doing. And I think that ultimately that felt like it was because education was something that I had to get through not necessarily something that I was obtaining. But I yeah, I don't, I, to her point, I don't know like what her wage is. I don't think teachers' wages are unlivable. I think that's like a huge jump to be making, but they should be higher. There's no question about that, but they're not unlivable. Yeah. <laughs> I think what really pushed me to go into teaching was wanting to give kids a space where they didn't feel the way I feel growing up, where they felt like they had power to make choice in their education and that their education could be powerful in aiding them to do what they wanted to do. Mm. So I'm not a teacher. I don't know how much you guys make. And I'm not going to use you as the example. I'm going to use a friend of mine. She's been at a, a school for a number of years. I want to say it's six, seven, eight years. And she's become tenured. And through her tenureship, she's accumulated so much wealth. I'm appalled at how much she's making because she teaches Spanish to sixth graders. And she's making over $150,000 a year. Can I ask you a question? What kind of school does she work at? Public school. Interesting. Yeah. And it, so I mean, for how me, much it, experience goes on with that too? It must, I'm assuming, because yeah. you've invested into your career, which I right. think everybody should. But for me, I look at it as you're making $150,000 in nine months. I, I uh, the prompt very clearly was, are teachers paid enough? Yeah. I don't see what his point is necessarily there. If you, it, and I don't know what, how well she's doing her job, but if you have students coming into your classroom who speak English and they're walking out speaking Spanish, 
here's one hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm like, sure, fine, take it. And it's parent teachers don't work through the the summer, so we assume. So to his point that oh, you're getting one hundred fifty for nine months. Well, they don't work through the summer. Do you want teachers to have to get a second job during the summer to uh, to be able to like afford whatever their lifestyle is or to take care of their families? It's all about. I think it should be based on merit. Tenure does speak to merit. If you've managed to stay at your institution. Not uh, necessarily, though. Well, uh, not necessarily. I know. It speaks but, to longevity and experience, which I think is course. where he's locating his criticism. Right. But it's, it's you know, typically, I get that the tenure system might be a little bit out of whack. And it's very hard to fire teachers, which we can get into a whole conversation about teachers unions and the protection for bad teachers. That's a whole separate issue. But teachers who are lasting, doing their jobs. Yeah, I don't see. I wouldn't hear 150 and be like, oh. That's insane. That's disgusting. I can't believe you're getting paid You've been that in California much. too long. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But, I don't know. But, it depends. Obviously, it's going to be state dependent. A state in Idaho, like Idaho's not paying their teachers 150. I don't care what anybody says. They're not right. paying a public a public Spanish teacher 150. Right. Like um, San Francisco area pay their police officers in excess of six figures. It's just like a normal thing there. Right. It's because it's different. Uh, but I will say, like the the idea that you know if you last a certain amount of time and you're you end up get like there's no incentive to the, the incentive structure in, in that this teacher followed that he's using as an example mm-hmm. is just stay in your job as long as possible right. accumulate that tenure and then collect the checks and now you are doing the same or you have no incentive to be doing better work sure it's just you could be doing worse work 30 years in or mailing it in um and then you're getting paid more and more and more right. and i will say also like california's pension system is completely upside down it's like worse than social security uh because they're paying out so many uh pensions mm-hmm. uh from people who've retired and followed this path to its extreme yeah and the state's going broke because of uh systems like that and so it's just um, the whole as a, system's out of whack right and so I think that there there is logic to what he's saying. I don't know that he's like bringing it forward the best way, but I, but I'll I'll give him that you know there there's a messed up way. But I think yeah. I hope that where this conversation is going though is like good teachers should get rewarded, and we go into like the school choice conversation, and and yes. good teachers should be hired by good schools, and then parents yeah. don't fund bad teachers, and then my question, and then the teachers unions protect bad teachers and don't and don't yeah. allow them to roll out and hey, apparently you're not a good teacher, so you should be rolling out of this career and find another thing to do. Right. And what do they have to say about that? So I hope that's where we're going. Yeah, it's like okay, get move towards school choice, get rid of the teachers unions and have a merit-based judgment on teachers that's not based on common core and these standardized tests is really where we go that's a whole flipping of the system unfortunately so that is very very difficult but if you're concerned about like where money is being spent in the school systems i don't think you have cause not you you have a little bit of cause but like teacher salaries is not where your concern should lie definitely not where to start right it's not like Ew, she's a Spanish teacher that makes 150K. I'm pissed about that. You should see how much of their budgeting is going towards just bull shit. And I mean, we're not. I've had to work second jobs doing DoorDash Mm -hmm. just because I wasn't making enough. If you look at these shoes, they are ripped. They are broken from a teacher wish list. I could not even buy these shoes myself. You know what I'm saying? I don't make enough money. So I wanted to clarify, this isn't an absolute. I'm not saying that every teacher is paid enough. I have no idea what your salary is. I have no idea any of those details. I'm just recognizing that if a teacher is getting nine months and their salary is in nine months, they get a summer off. Most, most of society isn't given three months to just That's go That's assuming they have three months. I'm an 11 month employee for one whole month out of the year. I'm not paid anything, Same. nothing. I have to figure out my funds, save money that I don't have mm. to. And it's like, okay, think about the work that teachers do outside of their jobs. Like they don't just spend the whole summer sitting around. Some teachers are working second jobs. Like when I was a kid, I would have a teacher and then during the summer I'd see them like working at Walmart. Like what the hell, what are, mm-hmm. you, what are you doing? That's that's something, a link in the chain is broken and needs to be fixed there. Also, teachers spend the summer developing their own curriculums for their classrooms, making sure their classrooms are stocked up for the kids that are coming in in a matter of months. They watch your kid all day long for hours and hours and hours, 20 of our, our community's children, and they go home and grade their homework. They go home and, and read through emails that parents, they set up parent-teacher conferences that often happen, and that always happen outside of school hours for the most part. So there is a lot of extra work outside of just like the nine month period that you send your kid to school that teachers are doing actively. So that's something to be mentioned too. Try to supply for a month, month and a half. I, I don't get supplementary, supplementary income. Like, that doesn't happen. 
And I think that's where we'll close out today's video. They got a couple more prompts on this. So you guys can check it out at Jubilee if you want to go and watch the rest of it. I think it was a good, fruitful conversation. I think it's pretty solid. Yeah, I, I don't think forth. anyone's mind was changed no. on either side. But no. they got to say their piece and they were respectful, I guess. Yeah, and it was fine. They didn't really go into uh, banning topics from, from schools, which is interesting. Mm. Just a little bit into the sexuality. And maybe these other prompts get into it. I see they talk about critical race theory and the quality of education is the government's job, which we can mm. talk about in a different video. But yeah, I think this was a good conversation. At least they got together and had it. And shout out to Marissa and uh, Alicia who, who showed up and actually wanted to talk to people with dissident opinions because we don't mm -hmm. do that very often. Sean for his tone. And Sean nice. for his tone. And it really, I mean, and everyone the except teachers. for the except for the older teacher guy. Who yeah, except was for the a little, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he didn't have the most respectful tone. But, yeah, you just know, a little we're, bit. We're not the tone police over here. I will say the biggest thing that stuck out to me in this is just the like breakdown, and it's this is this is just a microcosm of the broader cultures. There's just been a breakdown of like a shared reality, mm -hmm. and both sides. Well, especially like the liberal teachers who, you know, we're talking about like, oh, the pronouns came up. It, they they view themselves as neutral. They view their place that they're coming from is the neutrality. Yeah. And the conservative parents are like, no, when I was a kid, we didn't go there. That was neutrality. Right. And so there's a war on the definition of like, what is the neutral space? What are the shared values that we have that we both respect? Yeah. And um, both sides seem not to be able to process that they're they're speaking past each other because uh, they define reality in different ways. And in the middle sits the children. Yeah. You have to take in all of this. And, you know, if the 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 point that's being lost here is that, like, you have parents stressed about this. Guess where that stress goes? It goes out into the ether and out into the school board meetings, but it also goes into your child. Your child recognizes all of this, whether or not they're old enough to understand it and recognize it. They see it. A teacher that's being underpaid and is worried about paying for gas or is having all these conversations about political ideology and maybe it gets heated in the classroom. All of this stuff. A teacher who is overwhelmed. Where is that stress going? Out into the ether and out into the classroom and into your child. All of this is recognized by children through what they are seeing and perceiving and they take it all in. So as long as we keep battling over this and battling over these children, guess what they're seeing? Parents and adults battle it out and duke it out and they're getting mixed messages and whiplashed all around at an age where they're not capable of understanding what's going on. And that is what they take in. So the fact that we have children growing up who are just dealing with all these mental health problems and it's being glamorized and fetishized now and people are attaching themselves to it while also looking up at adults for guidance and seeing nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's what's lost in this conversation. So yeah. at least they all got together to talk about children. Yeah, which really puts the onus on us as adults um, and responsible citizens to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that means, you know, we're going to disagree. We're going to come from different places. But for, for the sake of our children, for the sake of our future, of our country, like we got to figure it out. And so we have to have the conversation. We, it can't just be this like two sides that are, you know, unstoppable force, immovable object, just warring at each other. We yeah. got to figure out how to have conversations. So I will give props to Jubilee and the people who came out to this video for yes. at least attempting to have a conversation. It wasn't the cleanest thing, but... And as much as there is hope, it's in this direction. Yes, it is. Good on y'all. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Leave your comments down below about how you felt about these different topics. I feel like everybody was pretty reasonable coming to the table with their own with their own interests, their own demands, their own values, and their own ideas. And they duked it out. So duke it out in the comments down below. Also, like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we post a video for you guys, which is every day. And if you'd like to join the Discord server, it's in the link in the description where we talk about these topics outside of the show. Thank you so much for watching. I can't wait for my middle ground episode to come out. I wonder if I fumbled the bag at any point. We're going to find out and I'm going to psychoanalyze myself. <laughs> so <laughs> it's going to be fun. Can't wait to see it. Bye, guys.